Portfolio Management and Overview. In this reading, we will talk about a portfolio approach to investing. We'll then discuss the steps in the portfolio management process. Section 4 deals with different types of investors. Here we will talk about individual investors as well as institutional investors. Section 5 gives an overview of the asset management industry. And then Section 6 deals with mutual funds and pooled investment products. Let us start by understanding the concept of a portfolio and this term called portfolio approach. When we say that we are taking a portfolio approach, that means that we are evaluating individual investments by their contribution to the risk and return of an investor's portfolio. Let's say an investor has a portfolio of three different stocks, A, B and C. And the investor is considering whether to add stock D to this portfolio. With the portfolio approach, the investor will consider what happens to the return and risk of the portfolio with and without stock D. That is called a portfolio approach. If the investor is not using a portfolio approach, then he will simply look at the risk and return of stock D in isolation. And as you might imagine, the right approach is the portfolio approach because ultimately the wealth of the investor is based on his portfolio. So what really matters is the impact on the portfolio of adding or not adding another investment. Next point, portfolio diversification helps investors avoid disastrous investment outcomes. Let's say that an investor holds a particular stock and say this stock is the Enron stock in 1999. What is the potential disastrous situation here? It turns out that by the end of 2001 or early 2002, Enron stock had essentially gone down to zero. If the investor's entire net worth was tied up in this one stock, then Clearly, that is a disastrous investment outcome. On the other hand, if the investor was diversified in the sense that in addition to Enron stock, he had several other stocks, then the fact that one of the stocks goes down to zero has a relatively small impact on the overall portfolio. Portfolio diversification can also help reduce risk. And this is measured using a diversification ratio, which is given right here. Let's understand the basic concept first. Going back to a simple portfolio, stocks A, B and C. If we look at these three stocks and let's say that they are from three different industries, then there is a chance that when A is going up, B is going down and C is staying flat. And maybe when A is going down, B is going up. If these three stocks are from different industries, then they do not necessarily move up and down together. Their movements to some extent cancel each other out. So the overall risk of this portfolio is going to be less than the risk of holding any one particular stock. This is called a diversification benefit. A simple measure of the diversification benefit is the diversification ratio, which is the risk of equally weighted portfolio of N securities divided by the risk of a single security selected at random. Let us use the standard deviation of returns as a measure of risk and say that the standard deviation of returns is 20% for each one of these individual stocks. And let's say that the standard deviation of returns for the overall portfolio is 15%. And the reason this 15% number is lower than the 20% number is because the movement of these stocks is not all necessarily in the same direction. So because of diversification, the overall risk is a little less. Coming now to the ratio, the risk of Equally weighted portfolio of N securities in this case is 15%. That's the numerator. 
divided by the risk of a single security selected at random, that would be 20%. So our portfolio diversification ratio is equal to 3 over 4 or 75%. Notice that if the diversification is better, if the portfolio risk had been reduced to 10%, then our ratio would be 10 over 20 or 50%. In other words, a lower ratio is better and a lower ratio is showing a higher degree of diversification. Composition matters for the risk return trade-off. I'll explain this at a very high level right now and in the next reading we will see this point in a lot more detail. Say we go back to our three stocks A, B and C. One possible portfolio is an equally weighted portfolio where you put one third of your money in each stock. This is portfolio one. Another portfolio is where you put 50% of your money in A and then 25% of your money in B and C. Let's say this is portfolio two. All this point is saying is that the risk return trade-off also depends on the relative weight of each stock in a portfolio. And again, we will see this in more detail later. The final point here is that portfolios do not provide guaranteed downside protection. There are situations, especially during a financial crisis, where all your investments in a portfolio might do badly. Next, we come to the steps in the portfolio management process. There are three major steps, planning, execution, and then feedback. In the planning phase, we as portfolio managers need to understand our clients' needs, and then we need to create a IPS or a investment policy statement. This will define the needs of the client. It will indicate what his or her risk tolerance is, what the liquidity needs are, whether the client has a short-term horizon or a long-term horizon, what are the return requirements given the various constraints that the client has, and so on. All that needs to be defined in the IPS. Next comes execution, where based on the IPS, we do an asset allocation. Very broadly speaking, asset allocation refers to how the client's money is allocated across different asset classes. Simplistically put, we can have stocks as one asset class, bonds as another asset class, and say alternative investments as a third asset class. For a given client, we might say that stocks represent 60%, bonds represent 30%, and 10% goes into alternative investments. Then we can have sub-asset classes, but that is something we will talk about in another reading. After we do asset allocation, we then need to do security selection, which means identifying the specific securities that need to be purchased. Once we've identified the securities, then we construct the portfolio, which means that we actually need to go purchase those securities. After execution, we come to step three, which is feedback. Here we need to monitor the portfolio and rebalance. We need to check whether a client's situation has changed, and if it has, the portfolio needs to be adjusted. We need to check whether the financial markets are performing the way we expected. If not, then adjustments need to be made. We also need to look at whether our stocks and bonds are still in our target asset allocation. If it turns out that stocks have done extremely well and stocks have become 90% of the portfolio, then we need to rebalance so as to come back to our original asset allocation. That is called rebalancing. On a periodic basis, typically every quarter, we need to measure our performance and report. As I said, this could be every quarter or this could be every month, but there needs to be a mechanism whereby we measure performance and report the performance to our clients. 
On this slide, we will talk about the investment needs of different types of clients. Very broadly speaking, we can either have individual investors or institutional investors. Let's start with individual investors. The time horizon for individual investors will vary based on the investor. If your client is a young professional with a good salary and lots of money to invest, then he will have a long time horizon. On the other hand, if your client is someone who will retire in two years, she will have a short time horizon. Risk tolerance will also vary based on your client. Risk tolerance very simplistically depends on the ability to take risk and the willingness to take risk. And this is something that we will discuss in a later reading. Income needs refers to the income that your client needs from the investment. If your client is someone who has retired and needs a regular income coming from her investment, then clearly the income need is high. On the other hand, if your client is the young professional I just spoke about, then the income need from the investment is low. So this again will vary based on the client. Liquidity needs, this refers to the need to get extra cash, be it for expected reasons or unexpected reasons. If your client plans to send his daughter to college in four years time and will need a hundred thousand dollars that is a specific liquidity need so again the liquidity needs will vary based on the client coming now to institutional investors defined benefit pension plan the time horizon will depend on the amount of time it will take on average for the employees to retire. Typically, this is going to be long term. Risk tolerance generally is going to be high. The reason is that given that the time horizon is long, defined benefit pension plans can typically take on high risk. The income needs generally will be high for mature funds, which means that if your fund needs to start paying pension benefits, then the income needs will be high. On the other hand, if you have a growing fund where the pension benefits need to be paid after a long time, then the income needs will be low. So income needs really depends on the state of the pension plan. The liquidity needs for a defined benefit pension plan generally tends to be low. Next we come to endowments and foundations and these generally are bracketed together. Large universities have endowments. The endowments are used to pay for the expenses of the university. Charitable organizations have foundations and the money that is generated from the investments are used to pay the foundation's expenses. The investment needs generally tend to be similar for endowments and foundations. The time horizon for endowments and foundations tends to be very long. The risk tolerance again is high. Generally when you'll see a long time horizon the risk tolerance will be high. The income need is to meet spending commitments. Liquidity needs are generally low because endowments and foundations don't have unexpected expenses. Banks have a relatively short term time horizon, which means that the risk tolerance will be low. The income needs are low but the liquidity needs are high so that depositors can be paid when they want their money. With insurance companies you need to recognize that there are two different categories. There is life insurance and property and casualty which need to be treated slightly differently. The time horizon for property and casualty 
tends to be short term whereas for life insurance companies the time horizon tends to be long term the risk tolerance is low for both because insurance companies need to make payments when claims come in so they cannot invest in risky investments the income needs tend to be low for both types of insurance companies and the liquidity needs tend to be high the reason we have a low risk tolerance here despite a relatively long time horizon is because of this high liquidity need investment companies these are mutual funds and we'll talk about them later the time horizon will vary it will depend on the particular fund the risk tolerance will also vary depending on the fund the income needs will vary the liquidity needs are relatively high which means that we would have mostly liquid investments i have covered this material at a very high level here which is good enough for level 1 at level 3 you will see the same topic covered in a tremendous amount of detail